wants and it's always good. <clears throat> so uh, the mental anguish that um, I went through was about three and a half years ago. And I've been a Christian about 12 years now. And I was born into a Christian family. My dad's a pastor and I thought I was a believer all along until I got saved. Well, I genuinely met God. And um, anyways, three and a half years ago, um, a few months before that, I was praying to God, I just want more in my life. I want more of him. And I didn't know um, just what to expect, but I just surrendered myself to him. I said, God, just live your life in and through me, do whatever you want. And um, I believe God answered my prayer. And I don't have enough time to go into all that detail, but what shortly happened was my mother-in-law from South Korea sent me this thing called um, Korean ginseng. And it's uh, like a herbal, um, it's not a medicine, but it's like a herbal thing that helps you with your immune system. But I didn't know this at the time, but it, uh, the biggest side effect is insomnia. And so I was taking this for 40 days and I could not sleep well. And it was just miserable sleep. And I thought there was something wrong with me. And so I started to <clears throat> go to the doctor and get some prescription medication. <clears throat> and that didn't really work. And um, when you say uh, prescription medication, are you talking just normal medicines or psychological medicines or? So it was, um, I don't remember what it was called. It, it's very strong. Yeah, it's like, um, yeah, it's the kind that just puts you to sleep. Like you take okay. it in about like 20, 30 minutes, you're out. And, okay. But what it was doing was it was making me wake up without me realizing and doing things. Like mm -hmm. I was waking up my wife in the middle of the night and I can't remember having a conversation with her. And I was trying to fix the humidifier one time and I know, so it scared me a lot. <clears throat> Excuse me. So that's the kind of medication and there's anti-anxiety medication um, later along the line. And then it, all of that hurt me. But um, what developed from insomnia was anxiety trying to figure out what was wrong with me. And the anxiety got really big and it started to create uh, panic attacks, which I've never experienced and I was ignorant of. And then um, I started to um, have really bad depression. And then I went into, um, yeah, feel free to ask any question and stop anytime. Yeah. How long of a time frame was this? So you, you were taking that ginseng stuff, you, your uh, relative sent you, and then the insomnia started. How quickly after that? I mean, how much of a time frame was this? So this was uh, 40 days of, of uh, struggling, of going downhill. Okay. And I developed a little bit of um, panic attack going to that 40 days. And then um, I got into a little bit of a depression. And then um, after the, the reason why the 40 days I say that is I prayed to God for help and I surrendered to him at that time, but it wasn't like a total surrender. But um, I really did hear from the Lord for the first time through a thought. And I know that might sound strange to you guys, but it was a foreign thought. I just knew it wasn't from me, it was from God. And the question was, what has changed in the last 40 days? And I said, it was a crazy ginseng. I found out by looking up on my phone. So I thought I was healed, but um, I stopped taking it. But the anxiety was uh, continuing and the panic attacks were continuing at night. And now I didn't know what was wrong. You know, it could be like maybe chemical damage in my brain or I don't know what it was and the anxiety got worse and the panic attacks got stronger and stronger. This is after the 40 days. And then um, I went really downhill for another, like a total of three months from the day I started. And so by the time I was going downhill, a total of three months, the panic attacks were so bad that it was hurting my chest throughout the, the daytime. And at night it kept me awake. My, my face was just flushed white. I was 15 pounds lighter and the depression has grown into something that um, it's just unrecognizable, like in anything you would like read. You have to experience it to know it's like getting eaten from the inside out. And I almost felt like I exited my body and I was looking at the back of my body, walking around, just saying, it needs to be put out of its misery. It's just weird. Mm -hmm. I just totally depressed. And then um, that's where the fearful and suicidal thoughts came. And all I could think about was I'm trying to kill myself. And I looked at my life insurance. I had three months left for it to get paid out. It had to be like two years. And then eventually was suicidal and <clears throat> I um, almost took my life, you know, with my shotgun, which is, I got rid of it now. <laughs> like, anyways, I couldn't do it because I have two daughters. It was, just, it was unbearable thinking, just leaving my kids. Wow. And it was at the end of myself where I had no option. I couldn't kill myself and I didn't know how to live that I gave up. And then the next day my depression, I think left. And the reason I, I'm pretty sure it left, but I was still in total agony because of all the panic attacks, anxiety, tension span, four seconds. I'm an accountant, so it's very, you can't even work like that hardly. It's so difficult. Wow. Yeah. 
it's um and i had yeah, the depression depression gone but then the fearful and suicidal thoughts wouldn't stop so when you say aaron when you say that uh you got to the end and you gave up um was that like an uh an experience with god that happened or did you just say in your own self like i don't know what to do i give up so was it a god interaction or was it just a you just in yourself saying i give up yeah great question it was not with god and okay. so it was just by myself i just i acknowledged i'm helpless and i felt like i was doomed and i just let go and i just didn't care if i lived or died mm -hmm. so yeah god didn't come into the picture yet so yeah, that's pretty interesting because I believe the depression did leave after that moment. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. And so it was just a couple days after that my dad recommended a book to read called Handbook to Happiness by Dr. Charles Solomon. Handbook to Happiness? Yes. Okay. Handbook to Happiness. And yeah, I don't want to get too long, but that book showed me that my trial, was a, there was a purpose to it and that God was bringing me to the end so that I could totally, totally surrender mm -hmm. and trust in him alone. And so... Um, there I really entered total surrender by looking at all the things I was holding on to, my comfort, um, all my future hopes, my dreams, my family, money, health. I just gave it all up. And I said, God, it's yours. And I went up on the altar as Romans 12, one said to buy, offer your body as a living sacrifice. And I said, God, here I am. Do whatever you want. I serious. I really meant it from my heart. And I still do. I don't care if I live or die. Whatever you want to do, just do it. I'm yours because I can't live this life anymore. I'm done with it. So you live it and you do what you want with it. That's was a lot of, was a lot of your suffering, Aaron, were you alone in a lot of it? Um, because what's different than, uh, with my story and your stories, you had a spouse and two kids. Mm -hmm. I mean, I can't even imagine because my suffering, uh, I was a alone so I could just wail. I didn't, I mean, I had responsibilities. Like I had to like cringe through work type of a thing. But I was able, when I wasn't at work, I was able to just go home and, and be alone and wail. But you had, you know, a spouse and two kids. So what was that yeah. variable like? It was very difficult. My wife didn't, you know, she had a very difficult time, as you'd imagine. You know, she's losing her husband, it feels like, to her. Just, I'm going crazy in her eyes. And so she had a very difficult time. And then my daughters didn't really know what was going on at the time. Mm. Was there How old were they? <clears throat> so they were maybe three and six okay yeah and so they didn't really know but they knew there's something wrong mm. oh yeah the um and so what ultimately happened was i surrendered and i just hung on to his promises like completely and there's a new promise every day and this sounds weird but i found a new promise every day because i felt like the promise i got the prior day lost its power and i know i know that's not true but I kept on feeling that way. So I was frantically searching for a new uh, promise because I realized that was helping me. And then it was like Isaiah 41.10, you know, that helped me a lot. And then there was a lot of different promises in Isaiah, you know, in the Gospels, Galatians, Philippians. But the three that helped me the most that I still hang on to today is 2 Corinthians 12.9, that his grace is enough for me. And what that means is that whether I pray for it and I don't even have to ask for it, it's mine. No matter what, his grace is always enough. It'll sustain me and even allow me to behave as a child of God, no matter how much pain and suffering I'm in. <clears throat> and then Romans 8, 28 says that uh, he uses everything for my good. And so the insomnia, fearful, suicidal, everything is using it for my good. I can't see how now, but he is. And I believe that wow. in Galatians 2, 20, I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. So I'm like, I don't feel like it, but I believe it. I know it's true, even though my emotions, you know, is I have questions and doubts. I like, no, I'm going to put that all aside. I'm going to just believe in the word of God. So as I hung on to his promises, it was my faith in those promises that healed me in the end. And so it was my God-given faith that I put onto his word. And then over the next three months, as I hung on and I just fixed my gaze on his promises or just Jesus alone, and I just seeked him and I got well without really realizing it it was so gradual that you couldn't tell like oh i feel better than yesterday but i was able to look back two weeks ago you know i did get better from two weeks ago my church people my family you, your countenance is better you're doing you, hey, did you just smile you know and so over the three months i was completely healed 
Wow. So you went from, so at the start of the 40 days, you started taking the ginseng or whatever it's called. And then mm -hmm. there was the uh, anguish that began during that 40 days with insomnia, anxiety, and some panic attacks. And then you got off of that uh, ginseng thinking that that was the problem, but then uh, it continued um, probably because you were in already, the dominoes had started falling as far right. as the anxiety affecting you type of thing. So then right. that continued. So from the start of taking that ginseng to uh, the zenith of your anguish, it was three months time right. period. Yes. And then at the end of the three months, uh, from three months onward, how long did it take for you uh, when you began, you would say, recovering or uh, you saw that God was healing you? Another three months. Okay. Yeah. So, uh, so you're... Was... Yeah. So your, your story was, uh, your anguish in a sense lasted six months and this, what year was this in again? Um, I don't remember 2016, maybe 2017, something like that. I forget okay. now. Yeah. Got it. Because, and again, uh, we discussed this when we met, but for a lot of people suffering out there, uh, I guess to start as far as the questioning back and forth and the just discussing these things, Aaron and I uh, have very genuine experiences of really, really suffering. Um, and, uh, and I've heard more of Aaron's story and, and most of you have heard my story. It wasn't fake. It wasn't, uh, it wasn't like looking for a shortcut in a sense, because I don't know, I mean, Aaron, I tried everything. And that was, when you're suffering, I mean, for anybody who suffered, you're not just like sitting around Oh, I guess I'll just suffer all day today. Like for those who are genuinely suffering, it's like, I want out of this. I'm in a miry uh, pit, uh, the miry clay. Like I can't get out of it. Like, what do I need to do? So for me, I'm trying every possible option uh, across the spectrum of anybody who would want to help me. Um, and I know, you know, and you can attest to that too, uh, even in what you've shared already, like, we know the suffering for, for those of you who are listening out there. And, and just like with Aaron, Aaron's story was six months. I mean, my, my anguish lasted uh, three, three years, if not more, wow. where, um, you know, I, it was just terrible for me. And, and so everybody's journey is different. But regardless of the time span of uh, anguish to God moving, uh, we can see common uh, themes throughout people who have genuinely suffered. Not that suffering that you can non ungenuinely suffer, uh, but I mean suffering as to seeking God in the midst of the suffering. Some people suffer and they go after drugs, alcohol, um, you know, a myriad of things. But I mean suffering with God. I want to be saved. I'm not going after other things. God, I'm calling out on you. Uh, and so wouldn't you say, Aaron, that that's a, um, kind of one of the themes uh, as far as when people are suffering, that there's a difference between uh, suffering, uh, you know, I want to say unrighteously to suffering with God in mind? Yeah, yeah, definitely. I think what, when I heard your testimony and, you know, and there's others like us, but there's not many who are I like to call like deeply worked on, you know, refined in the, the furnace, where it's not just kind of a little anxiety that you could brush off after a couple of days, but something where, like you, I tried everything. You know, I, I talked to a psychologist, you know, tried therapy, tried uh, six uh, different drug medication, and then I was in a mental hospital for two weeks, mm -hmm. and none of it worked. And it's the kind of suffering that I would say is like you're in a pit and there's fire all around you, and you're trying to jump out. The best you can you're trying everything you can and nothing works and it's finally where you read the word of god and says look all these flames i'm using it for your good i'm refining you i'm molding you into the image of my son and my grace will sustain you in there and so you go you know i'm going to trust you god so you stop jumping and you sit down in the flames mm -hmm. and then you trust in him mm -hmm. and then after a while he picks you up and he molded you to be way more like jesus than what you were before so that's wow. what i see and what you went through and and, you know, A.W. Tozer calls it the dark night of the soul. You know, a lot of the saints that are way before us, they've been through it and they talked about it. Oswald Chambers, you know, the, just a lot of them. And that's how I got, um, got so much help, too, by reading their 
testimonies, their, what they had to say and the guidance they provided. Yeah, I mean, uh, hearing other people's stories uh, through my YouTube channel, there's a guy who emailed me and he hasn't slept in like four months and he's losing mental uh, cognitive abilities and all these things. And, and I told him, I said, the, the best thing you can do is know that there is hope, that people have been down this journey and through this darkness in a very genuine way. And they had, and God has saved them. And he's the same yesterday, today, and tomorrow. So when Christ is saving people in the gospel accounts, when he saves the gathering demoniac, when he saves um, uh, the leper, when he heals the blind man, when he uh, calls uh, Mary of Magdalene uh, to follow him, that same Jesus is alive mm -hmm. right now. That to me is... That was a huge one of, you know, I talk a lot about hearing the voice of God and revelations, I call them, just a revealing. Like there's a fact that God has, but we can't see it. And then in our calling out, he opens our eyes to that. And when we see, um, we, begin, we, we are saved. Uh, when we see God, when he speaks to us, he's bringing light to us. And that light saves us from darkness. Um, and so for some people, uh, the speaking, um, like you shared, like might be what is, what has changed in the past 40 days when you were talking about this. Mm -hmm. Um, and I guess another difference in our stories is that you were already a born again Christian, uh, when you went through this suffering, uh, while my story is, I, I don't believe I was saved. Uh, I actually, I, I would say, I, I know I was not saved. Uh, even after 28 years of church going and uh, missionary work and worship, you know, playing guitar and singing, um, writing about the things of God, talking about the things of God. But um, everybody's story is different. But I know for me, my, my suffering was to bring me to being born again, like the suffering in the womb of a babe being born and then being born again. Uh, while it seems like your story was uh, more of you're already saved, but God refined you. Right. Um, but I want to talk a, a little bit, Aaron, just about uh, how we can encourage those who are suffering out there. Um, some people have found themselves or finding themselves in anguish where it's, they've been uh, miserable for months and months and months. Uh, some people, because of this whole, uh, you know, the pandemic and all these things, are starting to experience anxiety for the first time. And it's a whole new world in a bad sense for them. Um, but what are some things you would encourage someone who is suffering uh, with mental anguish? Uh, what would you encourage them in? Or what are some things that they can do as to their seeking of God? Sure. Yeah, if someone is under heavy mental affliction, like with anxiety, and like you said earlier, I think you mentioned this, um, a lot of these comes together. You know, for me, it started with anxiety and then depression, panic attacks, and insomnia <clears throat> excuse me they feed each other and so if someone's going through this i hope they could take that as an indication that that weight is not for them to bear it's actually impossible you were never meant to worry about and try to hold all this together and i encourage you to let go and that's what god wants you know especially if you're a born again christian god wants you to take this opportunity to humble yourself before him and cast all your anxieties to him and then by doing this, you are humbling yourself and you're putting your trust in him as you surrender it all. And so the key thing is that you need to realize as a born-again Christian, you're right, is that what happened on the cross. You became his child by dying with him. You were buried with him. And then you rose again with him. And that's what the baptism and the water thing signifies. And so you have to realize that the old you died and now it's Christ who lives in you. And so if this Christ who lives in you, it's no longer your life, it's no longer your problems, but it's God's problem and his alone. And he wants you to give it to him and show you that he is faithful and show you that he has good plans and purpose for you and that his grace is enough for you and that he's everything for your good. And it finally comes to the point where you can read all the Bible and everything you want, but you have to ask yourself, do I trust God? And then you have to just decide, am I going to take him at his word or not? Mm. Just it's a simple thing. If God said this, do I believe it and will I believe it? Will I put my faith in it? Yeah, I think a lot of these things, uh, and I taught, I've spoken about this, the biggest thing about, uh, the most important thing in the journey of the Christian faith is uh, humble honesty 
before God. When we're suffering, you can't fake things anymore. Like when I was in my anguish, like I couldn't fake being happy will, outgoing will that everybody knew. The mm. suffering had uh, destroyed the ma or were destroying the masks of the outward personality or even even like because if people have known me and a lot of people listening have known me for many years like they knew me as very learned and upstanding and uh you know learned in the christian faith and uh man i can tell you stories just when i you know even when i was like on a summer project with campus crusade for christ and i would do things like going out and sharing talking to people about god for 24 straight hours like these are things people knew of me, but when I was suffering, it, it literally uh, inhibited or kept me from being fake in any way, shape, or form. Mm -hmm. And so what happens is in the pro uh, process of God breaking you down, he's showing you that you're not genuine in cer certain areas of your life. And unless you be genuine, you're, you're not going to be helped here. He's wanting you to see your incapability of saving yourself ultimately. Um, and that's one of the things uh, that I think is so critical of uh, honesty, rawness before God. Uh, I, I met with uh, a couple of Christians recently here and we were talking about, notice uh, in the Adam and Eve story, when sin came into the picture, what did they do? They covered themselves, right? With, uh, with, you know, whatever they used, but they, they covered themselves. Well, why, why did they do that? Well, something had happened inside that then in the overflow, they happened outwardly. So in the inside, they were hiding themselves from God. They ran away from him and they hid, but then they also covered something in their heart from God. And then that just, you know, the outward is always uh, shows what's happening inwardly. Mm -hmm. And so when they hid themselves, uh, they were hiding themselves from God. Now, what does God, and it said they, initially they were naked and unashamed, but when they saw their nakedness and sin entered, they were ashamed, so they hid themselves from God. So what God wants most from us is for us to come and say, God, I'm not going to hide anything from you in my heart. I'm, I'm being as honest as I know how to be, humble, raw before you. And when he gets us there, I really believe that's when he begins to speak. Um, Aaron, you shared at the start of your story, you heard the voice of God yes. about what's changed in the past 40 days. What, have you had any other experiences from that point with the voice of God and hearing the word of God? And what has that been like for you? Yeah, I only heard his voice just one more time after that. Okay. And, um, it was actually when I was um, maybe like two weeks into starting to get a little better but I was still struggling so bad. And then I was in my shower actually, and I didn't have, you know, if you know, I just have, didn't have the strength to even brush my teeth, you know, and take a shower and then go to work. It just seemed like a monumentally impossible thing with all this mental affliction raining down on me. And then I said, God, I need help. Like, please help me. And I was just like crying out to him. And then that thought from God is just another foreign thought where I just, new wheels from God and said, he said, do you trust me? And I just looked out the window <laughs> and he said, yes, I do. And just that gave me the strength. It almost like gave me strength for my knees and my ankles and my body was able to stand up straight. And I, said, I do trust him. So that, that was the only other time where, but then, you know, not, it doesn't have to be a voice too, or actually it wasn't a voice, but a thought. But he um, works in so many different ways to communicate to us, you know, usually through the word of God. But um, one confirmation, too, um, I was asking God for encouragement. I need help. And this is when I went to work and I opened my phone. And then, you know, those Facebook messages that says, you put this up a year ago, a reminder. Yeah. And it said, a prayer that I made now sharing with everybody. I realized it's not praying about things or making my life or just things. And it said, it's more about asking God to make his will, your will, and for him to live his life in and through you. And so I was like, wow. And God just spoke to my heart there and said, I'm answering your prayer, Aaron. You prayed for this a year ago. I am answering it. You know, this is the exchange life, the abundant life that he spoke of. Jesus spoke of in John. He came to give us an abundant life. And this is how you do it. You live like a child in front of him with childlike faith taking him at his word so you could just be free and put all responsibilities on our father 
I think that's how you live a life that is fulfilling and victorious. Mm, yeah, that's right. Yeah, and you mentioned too, uh, and one of the things I've really learned because you know, sometimes I see in all honesty, pride start to come in my own heart, even, even today and recently, if, if I make my life so too much about my story of like, man, God did this like miracle. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, and that's years ago. And then I, I lean on that miracle and I forget that he wants to give me something today. Like mm -hmm. you said, that is fresh and new and needed today that I didn't have yesterday. Um, mm -hmm. And then tomorrow I'll need something else of him. And what I, what it kind of reminds me of is just like myself with my child and my wife with my child, we're giving him exactly what he needs today to sustain himself. Mm -hmm. So I'm not going to put a big burger right in front of my one-year-old. You know, I'm going to give him small pieces of bread or I'm going to give him uh, healthy snacks today, but every day I'm giving him something of what he needs. And, and that's what I've found in my relationship with God. Um, he, he, he knows exactly what you need today. And like you said, Aaron, a lot of suffering, there's so many layers. There's uh, anxiety, depression, OCD, intrusive thoughts, um, uh, despair, all these things, they become so layered that you don't even, you don't know what you need. You, and, and you have so many issues at that point that it becomes so overwhelming. You, you're like clueless and you become, and, and I've dealt also with confusion, uh, which is another miserable anguish of you can't even think straight. Mm -hmm. um, but God knows exactly what you need. He knows the uh, exact food that you need, if you're suffering out there, that you need today. So what Aaron and I are saying is, come before him and say, God, here I am with all my mess, all of these issues, um, all of these anguishes. But here's the thing, you have to turn your attention to him. Um, because the world has so many things that they want to offer somebody who's suffering. But when we're turning our attention to God, he's saying, ah, this is what I want. I want someone who has sought me out to help and to save. And so it's when we do that, God says, I know exactly what you need and you have come to me for it. So I am going to give it. And for me, I mean, so I had 28 years of like religion and learning and all these things. You would have thought, like Will, what Will needed when uh, at his first day of being saved and born again was something like, you know, very, uh, you know, to answer one of my anguishes or, you know, one of my immediate sufferings. But the first bread that God gave me, the first word he gave me was about creation itself, that he created all things. He knew that's what I needed before I could, you know, before I could eat a Big Mac in the spiritual life. Right. I needed something that's like, what do you give when I'm, you know, I needed milk or like a little, little small little piece of bread here, child, this is what you need today. And, and that's what happens in this journey of, of anguish. Come to him and then say, God, will you, will you speak to me today? And he will give you exactly what you need if you have sought him. Have you seen that to be true, Aaron, as far as, um, uh, or can you speak a little more of how God has kind of fed you every day and in those experiences? Sure. Yeah. Yeah. I totally agree. He meets you where you're at. He gives you what you can handle and, and what, what you can handle is actually beyond what you can actually handle, but it's you giving it to God and him handling for you. So yeah. Um, as I get, got into my trial, I just told God, I can't handle this. This is just overwhelming, but he was teaching me and leading me at this time. Aaron, I'm going to teach you how to eat meat through this trial. And it's got to start with you putting your faith in me completely. Don't just test the waters out with your toe, but dive in head first. Mm -hmm. And it's terrifying. You know, it's like, oh man, am I going to really take this Bible at its word and put my life on it? And it was the time. And it's kind of like those, um, like those ducks or some sort of geese in the nature videos where they have to jump off a cliff <laughs> or where they have to learn to fly and the parent pushes them off. That's kind of like what I went through. I felt like, I'm like, here I go. I have no choice. You know, I was being pushed into the abyss and then God had it all under control. He was teaching me. 
And that's what I'll say to a lot of people right now too. Like if you're not a believer and you're going through this hard time and you're looking at Jesus, it could be something like what you went through, Will, where God is leading you to salvation and much more. And then for those that are believers that are going through a very difficult time in your life where it's just brought you to the end of yourself, there is good things waiting for you. If you would just trust in him and put your total life in his hands, he's got a good will and purpose for you. And um, he's doing this because he loves you. Yeah. And another thing I would say too is I know for me, when I started really seeking um, God, (laughs) I mean, if you had asked me at the time, and I was going to a church at the time, if you had told me, Will, and you're seeking, uh, you're going to leave your church, get new friends, think differently of, like, uh, of God in the sense of you're going to be uh, more aligned to truth. Uh, you're going to change doctrines of how you think about God. Like, I, when I start, started to seek God, like, I just wanted saved. But in the saving, he transformed my thinking and learning about the sovereignty of God and learning about truth and walking in truth and, and all these things. So part of that surrender, and, and you mentioned this, Aaron, part of the surrender is saying, God, I surrender even my thinking. I surrender what I think is true. I surrender my dreams. I surrender, you know, what friends I have. I surrender what church I'm going to. I surrender, and he might keep you in the same church, but it's just the surrender of all. Whatever you place before him, he can transform. But if you withhold something, uh, he can't transform it because it's, it's not in his hands. Um, and so that's an encouragement, too, if, if you're suffering out there. Yeah. Be willing and be open to whatever God wants to do. And, and his changing, though it will be miserable and, and for some people. Um, for me, it was absolutely miserable. For other people, it's not as miserable because they're more humble than what I was. Uh, um, but it's the presenting of everything to him and, and he's going to, uh, correct you and, and guide you and change things about you, uh, that are going to be beautiful. I mean, they're going to be, you're going to look back and say, wow, thank God that he saved me in that area. And thank God that he saved me in that area. Um, so that's part of that surrender. Um, are there other things as to surrender? Like if somebody's so let's look at something right now. Um, uh, let's uh, a particular anguish, uh, OCD, mm-hmm. kind of like an obsessive compulsive disorder. And these are things like the science world labels them as, uh, yeah. you know, for what for what it's worth. But that's how people kind of say, oh, okay, I have that. Um, mm-hmm. But it's really just uh, unwanted thoughts, and then you're uh, repeating things. Uh, did you go through that at all, Aaron? And how, how did God work in the midst of that? Or do you have any thoughts to somebody who might be suffering with that? Yes, absolutely. That's a great topic. And um, I had OCD in, in regards to sleep. I was just getting too wrapped up into rituals and having to do this and that, you know, to sleep well. Oh, and, wow. um, and what you said was absolutely right. It's a, the battlefield is here. <clears throat> so when you're in OCD or any anxiety, depression, what you are forced into is spiritual warfare. And if you don't realize who your enemy is and how he's attacking you, you're not going to get better. And so this is where reality is that the the enemy is shooting down fiery darts at you through lies. That is the root of all your OCDs, depression, anxiety, fearful and suicidal thoughts. That's what I believe. And when you realize those thoughts are not your thoughts, and Neil Anderson says it well, he says, if you're thinking of thoughts that you don't want to think of, they're not from you. Mm. And thoughts of fear and anxiety and suicidal thoughts, <clears throat> they're, if they're not, from, they're not from God and you don't want to die and you don't want to think about these bad thoughts, well, it's from the devil. There's no other person. And once you realize that, that's like more than half the battle won or even wow. sometimes for some people, the entire battle. You go, wait a minute. Those are your thoughts and not mine. And some people, missionaries on the field, they have blasphemous thoughts. Yeah. And unfortunately, I know I've heard they even committed suicide. They just couldn't handle it and this the enemy's lies that wasn't exposed and whoever's watching here you know is i hope that you can realize those thoughts are not from you if they're inducing evil kind of fear ocd things like those thoughts are not from you if you don't want to think about it yeah and john so- bunyan uh who wrote pilgrim's progress uh at a portion of that book and it's the second most published book in the world's history i mean it's just a classic if you haven't read it but this character right. christian He's walking through the valley of the shadow of death. It's an allegory of writing, an allegorical writing. Um, And he's walking through the valley 
and he hears voices and it, and he says and the the character christian says it, it almost sounds as if they're my own thoughts mm -hmm. and he continues through the valley and then he's brought out of the valley and he turns around and so now the light's shining down into the valley and he sees all these evil characters who had been whispering into his ear as mm -hmm. he walked through the valley and they were even they were changing the pronouns they weren't you know they were changing the pronoun from you christian uh as far as using that pronoun of the thoughts, they were changing the pronouns to I, like that's the evil one can do that. And so, yeah, I, I totally agree. Knowing that not all the thoughts that you're thinking are your own is a huge aid. Um, okay. Mostly because, so you have your own thoughts, you have evil thoughts, but there's also words and thoughts that can come from God. Mm -hmm. And so the spiritual life is seeking his voice and his thoughts. And when you make that a habit, so if you're constantly feeding off of like bad thoughts and negative thought and terrifying thoughts, I mean, if I, there's a lot of shame, as you know, Aaron, in mental illness. I mean, if I were to share some of the thoughts that I had to go through, I mean, it's terrifying, but they're real. They're really real. Um, but these are negative thoughts. And if you constantly feed off of those things, you become ill. I mean, think if you eat snacks all day and bad food, you become ill. It's the same thing in the spiritual warfare uh, life. If you're only giving heed to those negative thoughts or those odd thoughts or those weird thoughts or those um, even thoughts where you try and make them false, but then they twist themselves and makes you think that they're true, you know, it's a deep chasm of terror that can happen. But those right. thoughts, if you keep focusing on them, then you're going to be ill. But if you focus, if you seek after the voice of God, I'm telling you right now, one speaking from God for me, uh, just one, uh, was able to blast away uh, a myriad of dark thoughts that I had been dealing with. Um, and, and then he speaks again, and then God speaks again, and you start to see, wow, his voice, his words are like, they're wonderful, they're beautiful, they bring me joy. If you look in the uh, Psalm 19, read Psalm 19 at some point, it says, you know, the statutes of the Lord, they bring me joy, uh, they're life-giving, all these things. So as an encouragement, if you're suffering out there um, with OCD, these thoughts, knowing that they're not of you, and they might not be your thoughts, but even if, even if some of the thoughts negatively that you have are yours, there is a voice that you can see that will bring life to you, that will bring life, um, and it's the voice of God. Um, Aaron, what are some of your, just kind of along those lines too, uh, uh, as far as the voice of God and seeking Him, and what's been your experience about, and, and it seems like maybe we're defining voice of God a little differently because you maybe yours are more kind of like an audible, like what have you, you know, the past 40 days or in the shower, do you trust me type of thing? Well, I'm seeing it more of uh, a revelation, uh, a, a speaking to the heart uh, of understanding or truth. But yeah, talk about that a little bit. Yeah. If you're yeah, like, I like to add stuff too. Yeah. To what you're saying. I, I feel like um, God meets us where we're at and he spoke to you in that way. And for me, um, those two instances, they were just super rare. And most of what God led me to, my two instances of hearing like those thoughts, which was, it wasn't audible, but it was a thought. It's kind of hard to explain. Um, but for me, the way that I got out of those intrusive, evil thoughts that caused all the mental afflictions, and this is what you can do too to all the you know, viewers, is to practically turn away from those thoughts and then look to God's word. Mm. So that's what I had to do. It was the word of God, like those Bible verses I explained. And it's so hard to do because our natural human tendency is to look at what we fear. Like, oh, no, we'll see. if there's a lion sitting right here, you want to just keep on looking at it. And then this demon came up to my face. I could feel his breath. And how could you not look at him and get more terrified? But there's a point where you just have to look away and look at his word and meditate on his word. And that's how I got better. I just focused on Jesus and his word and his promises and just decided I will not try to fix my own problems. I will not listen to these fearful thoughts and I'm going to just focus on the word of God. And so for me, that um, that's what I uh, teach in my YouTube channel too, is just to tell people you have to consciously look away and just decide to take 
uh, God at his word because he has given us the faith to do that. He's given us what we need to overcome, you know, through this trial and all of life. And so, yeah, I, uh, that's really uh, amazing what God does. You know, he met you in a different way. He like gave you those revelations and they're super powerful. And then for me, God didn't give me that kind of experience, but it was just the Bible, you know, just reading his word. I had no choice, you know, as I felt it helping. So that's what I kept on doing. I refused to look at my problems. Yeah, we have to remember that the spiritual life uh, is grace, meaning it all has to be given. It's nothing in and of ourself as to generating or working or striving to fix ourselves. God has made it that the entirety of the spiritual life, the entirety of the Christian life has to be given. And so um, kind of to tag what you're saying, Aaron, because I know there's some people out there who might have been like me when I was really suffering, I was doing everything. Like when I suffered with insomnia, I stayed at a, uh, there was a family from my church who let me come to their house and basically stay there. Um, but I had a chunk of uh, cards, index cards with Christian Bible verses written on them. Mm -hmm. And so I would like, so it's like late at night. And so I just start going through them and through them and going through them. And then I would put them down and be like, okay, go to sleep. And then, you know, I wouldn't go to sleep. Um, so for someone out there, here, here's what's happening here. Um, because there's a difference between seeking the Bible as a, like the letter, just as words on a page and seeking the Bible for the living being who wants to speak to you through the letters of the page. And so for me and my suffering, I'm just reading all these words, reading, reading, reading. And I was doing a myriad of other things. I mean, it wasn't just reading Bible verses. It was like, I mean, I tried all types of uh, sleeping teas and uh, melatonin. I mean, I tried, I tried it all. I tried it all. Um, but because my English uh, with in insomnia was terrifying. But all that happened for me to save me from the insomnia. I'm not kidding. Um, I, I put my life on this. All that happened to me is, you know, when I was suffering and reading all those verses, one of the verses was God gives sleep to the one that he loves. Like I had that in a stack of cards and I would read it over and over and over and it didn't help me. The only thing that helped me is when one day when I'm reading this and God spoke to me that verse into my heart. So it wasn't me just reading the page. It was God speaking. And that's a huge difference of recognize and that that's grace that's that's not me trying to generate this sleep into myself when <laughs> yeah. god speaks he's speaking these words to make them a living reality in your heart and and to me that's what faith is it's not reading the letters on the page okay believe it just get, uh, god give sleep to those the ones he loves you gotta get god got that's not faith faith is saying god i come before you in these these words on the bible God, will you speak to me? You're alive, God. I'm seeking you. God, I need your help. And whoever humbles himself and calls out on him, he will speak to you those things. Um, I, I, I put my life on that reality because it's so real. You ask my wife, I sleep like a baby now. And, and it's not me. It, it's a grace. God did it. Um, so let's talk. We've got about 15 minutes here. I'm going to look on the, um, on the page here. Uh, but Aaron, do you have any thoughts just on this topic of grace and God working in the midst of mental illness? And then uh, we'll kind of wind down type of a thing. Yeah. Um, do you mean like how God gives us grace to... Yeah, just like uh, the experience of grace in the midst of mental illness or any thoughts yeah. on why why grace is what's going to save us type of a thing. Yeah. I guess it goes back to second Corinthians 12, nine, how his grace is always enough for us. And, um, it's the real thing and his grace is always enough for us. And I guess I could talk about like how God saved me from insomnia. Like that's, uh, that's an awesome testimony how God saved you. And it's encouraging to hear how God does it, uh, according to how we need it. And for me, it was, I just realized his grace is enough for me <clears throat> as I'm having these panic attacks, I'm trying to go to bed and I can't, but it's okay because his great grace will sustain me. And no matter how much sleep I get, <clears throat> excuse me, God is going to use however much sleep I get, whether I get zero or however many, he's going to use it for my good. Mm -hmm. And so the next day, even if I get a little sleep, God's going to use that for my good. And his grace will sustain me today and tomorrow. Mm -hmm. And uh, I can't get his grace tomorrow, you know, for tomorrow. Only today and tomorrow is wait, waiting for me. And I realize when I'm really weak and I have little sleep, God actually uses my weakness 
to let him be more manifested in and through me. I saw the beauty of that. Wow. In my witness, God's love and compassion and understanding, just a lot of his attributes started to come out in me without me even trying. And so I really believe that. And I know that now too. And insomnia is no problem for the believer because he's going to use everything for your good, even your lack of sleep. Wow. What you believe. Yeah. Yeah. And I mean, a lot of these things too, like God, God will save us, but in the saving, um, when he speaks, like when he spoke to me, he gives, he gives sleep to the one that he loves. What I realized there is when my eyes are open and give an understanding of that, what I realized, why it, why it uh, helped me is because it removed fear. Well, why did it remove fear? Because I realized, oh, God says he's going to give me sleep. So if I don't sleep tonight, I'm going to sleep tomorrow night. And if I don't sleep tomorrow night, I'll sleep the next night. I don't, but the reality is, and the fact of the matter is, is I don't have to be afraid of not sleeping anymore. Right. Um, because when he speaks, he gives us understanding of that speaking. Those words are, it's like unfolded before us. And I, and I just realized, oh, that's why I don't have to be afraid of, because he tells me he's going to give it to me. So, and he can't lie. So now I don't have to be afraid of it any, anymore. I can just receive that and walk in light of that speaking to my heart. So that, and that's within, you know, insomnia, there could be a myriad of other things. Um, there could be self-harm thoughts. There could be um, irrational fears of illnesses. There could be, there could be uh, repetitive things as far as OCD goes. But what I found and what really helped me is, um, and Aaron kind of tagged on this earlier, it's no longer I who live, but Christ. So say it's a, say if it's a self-harm um, OCD thought, like you're always thinking about harming yourself, or um, you can ask for revelation from God about, well, Jesus didn't ever harm himself. Jesus is life-giving. Jesus laid down his life for other people. Jesus never hurt himself. So God, open my eyes to that reality. Speak that to me. And that's how you'll be free from the self-harm because it's no longer you living. Yeah, in the natural, just you left to yourself. Yeah, people are filled with rage and self-harm. But when, you're, when it's Christ living, Christ doesn't do those things. And so you can say to God, Jesus, well, I'm not going to do that. Uh, because you're living in me. It's, it's not me making the decisions anymore. It's no longer I, but you. So that was a big aid for me with a lot of the self-harm. And I went, I'm telling you, I mean, I don't know for you, Aaron, but for whatever reason, I needed to be broken in a lot of ways. So I dealt with a vast spectrum of uh, intrusive thoughts, uh, OCD uh, thoughts along those lines. And a lot of it for me was because I was just really jacked up because I suffered for so long and it had to be broken to that point. But um, yeah, God has a word. If you're out there suffering, God has an immediate word for you right now, knowing exactly what you're going through. Uh, he knows all the layers. He, he sees from outside looking in. He has a full orb understanding of exactly what you're going through. So all he wants you to do is say, God, speak to me. Um, I've come for nothing else but y your word to me. And, and open up the word, open up the word and say, God, speak to me what I need. I posted on the Facebook page uh, a tremendous website called, I think it's called BibleInfo.net or something like that. But if you just Google, what does the Bible say about peace? And the second or the third link will be this Bible info. And it, it just like gives a hundred verses about peace. Or if you search, what does the Bible say about sleep? What does the Bible say about, um, it could be any of these things, any topic, and it'll just give you all these verses. And for me, when I was suffering, I couldn't pick up a Bible. I was suffering too much. But I type in, what does the Bible say about peace? And mm. blasting me with like verse and verse and verse. So seek those things. Uh, and God's going to speak to you, uh, those things. But it might be through a, a, a Christian music video. It might be through what somebody says to you. I've experienced the voice of God through a, a brother talking, a friend talking to me. Um, he's going to speak to you. And it might be a myriad of different ways. It might be how he spoke to you uh, like Aaron. Um, but he is going to speak. And you're going to know when he speaks because the end result, what does Jesus say all the time? Your faith. So when God speaks, that's to your heart and you receive it. That's your faith. Your faith has made you well. 
Jesus says that time and time and time again. So if you're still struggling, you haven't heard his voice uh, in a particular area, and I know there's layers, but bring to him something and say, God, speak to me. What do I need to hear from you in this area? And when he speaks, you'll know he has spoken and you, you've received when you've been made well. I've been made well from insomnia. When he spoke to me, uh, uh, God gives sleep to the one he loves. So Aaron, we've got seven minutes. Uh, anybody watching live, any questions? I think I saw uh, um, some people on there. So if you have any questions, now's the time to do it. Um, otherwise, we'll kind of have closing thoughts. Um, I think it's a little lag time. Um, so we'll wait for questions, but Aaron, any kind of closing thoughts? Um, tell them about your YouTube page, but just anything where, you know, because our hearts are so for people who are suffering. I mean, Aaron, I know your heart and I feel like we're already like bonded for life now, just because we have suffered and, and we don't throw stones and, if we sound critical, we don't mean to sound critical. We, we've just had a genuine experience with Jesus and we want that experience for other people because for me to go from psych ward, uh, I remember being there and like tempted to bash the windows. I remember looking out and seeing a wall and thinking, well, I can run and jump over that wall. I got to get out of here. To go from that to where I am today by his grace, to have a wonderful wife and a child and him providing for me and to experience him. I mean, oh my gosh. Yeah. Amen. But, uh, any, any closing thoughts uh, from you, Aaron? Yeah. Um, I agree with you. There, you know, there's a question. Do you, do you ever struggle with intrusive thoughts even now? Um, I'll let you answer and I'll, I'll quickly answer too. Yeah. Those thoughts, they still come knocking, you know, they'll try to come and scare me, but I turn to the word of God and those three Bible verses that I mentioned, those are my go-to's. They're solid truth. His grace is enough for me. He's going to use everything for my goodness. Not I who live, but Christ who lives in me. And that immediately, that truth sets me free. And those intrusive thoughts, I used to have to say, like, in the name of Jesus Christ, be gone, evil spirits. But later, just the name Jesus is enough. And later, I could just ignore it because I know it's yeah. a lie. When you know it's a lie, it loses all its power. Wow, that's yeah. so good. I'm encouraged by you saying that. Yeah, I mean, I still, I would say I still daily deal with intrusive thoughts. Um, my anguish uh, worsened in a lot of ways when I try when you try and battle the intrusive thought uh, when you, in the sense of like trying to say no that's not true and you know you get kind of lost uh, because it's in the natural it's in your mind so you have no war, you have no weapons there but as Aaron is saying when, when, and I'm encouraged by what you just said whenever you hear that thought um, acknowledge it's there and it's fine that it's there I mean Jesus heard demonic thoughts as well from Satan. Uh, it's going, they're going to happen. But what, what's going to be different is you not looking at it like Aaron's saying, but turn to the word of God, have yeah. verses ready. And, and more importantly, seek the voice of God in those verses. Uh, because you don't want to take the letter back to the, to the attack, like just the, the words on the page, because Satan will twist. Look at the, and the temptation uh, of Jesus. Satan twisted scriptures. He'll do the same with you. So uh, don't take the letter, but ask God to speak to you. And so the, whenever Satan speaks and you're turning away and you're hearing the voice of God, eventually Satan's like, I'm not going to speak anymore because he keeps going to God and he's getting stronger mm -hmm. um, and he will lead you as you draw near to God. So, yeah, I would say, I mean, and I'm OK to say this, like I, I still daily deal with intrusive thoughts. The difference is they don't overwhelm. They don't overcome me because I know I can turn to God and hear his voice. Um, so you learn uh, these things and, and I know it's difficult and I know the suffering is real and it's hard. But when you hear those voices, reckon that they're, recognize they're not of you, turn, seek the voice of God in the, in the words of scripture or in uh, Christian videos or in other Christians. Um, and then as you do that, ask God to speak to you. Um, so I hope that answers your uh, question, Caitlin. Um, but yeah, so we got three minutes. I don't want to, uh, you know, draw this out too far, though. I know, you know, Aaron, this is going to help a lot of people. Um, I'm so, you know, blessed by your ministry and encouraged by you. But uh, any kind of closing thoughts and then, then we'll kind of wrap up. Yeah, Will, I just want to encourage you, you know, God bless you as you 
do this, that I feel that when God calls a man to do whatever he wants, like whether it be a missionary, pastor, or counselor, you, know, you will succeed if he calls you. So like, continue to fight the good fight and let you know, God just use you and you know, God bless your ministry. Yeah, thanks, man. Yeah, it's, a, it's amazing. There's so many hurting people um, and, and God just wants to show the world that he saves. He, he's dying, literally. He died to show the world that he wants to save people. And all he wants people to do is call out to him and to him alone. Not to call out to any other person or any other object. But when we call out on the name of the Lord, he says, yes, this is why I came. This Literally, my name is salvation, God says. His name is Jesus. So when we call on him, he's saying, yes, that's why I came. That's why I died. That's why I rose. I am so here to save you. And that's when his glory is revealed. When it's a broken human heart saying, God, save, save. And when you call on his name, save, he says, uh, you will be saved because you have called on my name. So Aaron, thank you so much, man. And uh, you guys yeah. can find, uh, just search Aaron Kim on YouTube, uh, A-A-R-O-N and then Kim, K-I-M. And uh, he, you give pretty frequent uh, encouragements and you share your testimony on there. Uh, maybe we'll bring you back on uh, here in months down the road to see what God's doing in you. I know uh, for you and for me, uh, we just want to say like, uh, you know, when the blind man was, was healed, he said, look, I don't know what happened, but I once was blind, but now I see. And that message to a dying world, I mean, a dying world can argue with uh, doctrine or uh, debate with uh, thinking of and opinions and who's right and who's wrong. But uh, that the world cannot question a life that has been changed. Mm -hmm. I mean, they couldn't question the blind man who's seeing. He was really seeing. So what are they going to say? Uh, you're, what happened to you is not real. No, they're going to say, oh, my gosh. Okay, what happened to you is real. So tell me about what happened to you. Right. So that, that's what we're doing. And uh, Aaron, keep doing that. And I'm excited to see uh, the, the lives, the ripple effects of, of your ministry. And um, blessings to you, man. So thanks again. Thank you for having me. Okay. All right. Hey, thanks, guys. I think... Uh, yeah, that's all the questions. So, all right, Aaron. Love you, man. We'll talk to you later. Thank you, brother. Okay. See you later.